There are some basic guidelines that should inform your decision making when crafting effective, readable graphics. And this is the most important one. Here's the whole semester wrapped up in a sentence. Make the most important stuff stand out the most. That's all you need to do. It's that simple. So we're going to talk about some ways to make that happen. Um, number one, visual hierarchy. This is what we're, we're talking about when we say things like make the most important stuff stand out the most. You do that using something called visual hierarchy. Um, this is the single most important concept I can pass on to you this semester. It doesn't matter if you're making maps, charts, or birthday invitations. You want to organize your design to make some elements more prominent and important than others. Others need to be less prominent. Um, align the message of the graphic. That's the intellectual hierarchy with the visual hierarchy. So again, this means you need to know what the main purpose of your graphic is and then decide which elements are the most important. Where your eye goes first when you look at a graph is the element that has the highest level in the visual hierarchy. Make sure that element is something important. We're going to discuss a lot of tools to use for visual hierarchy, things like figure ground, color, page layout, and contrast. So visual variables are things like size, color, how light and dark a color is, um, and there is an order to these, and they should be fairly intuitive. But when you know them, you can use them to your advantage. Big things draw the eye. Dark things on a light background draw the eye. This is true and needs to be considered both for the elements within a graphic or map as well as how the graphic or map sits on the bigger page or within the context of other elements on the page. So make sure you apply the principles of hierarchy to the title, grid lines, axes, labels, and other scaffolding or supporting elements. One way that you can test your visual hierarchy is to use the squint test. Literally squint and blur your image. Stand back from it. Walk across the room. Look away from it and then look back as if you're seeing it for the first time. Where does your eye go first? What draws your eye? What thing on the page does your eye see first? That thing should be the most important part of the graphic intellectually. The main message of your content and the most important supporting element should be the thing that your eye is automatically drawn to. We will look at a lot of examples of strong and weak visual hierarchy, but I really like this simple text example because it illustrates several things at once. You will read this first. I think you probably did. Center of the page, bigger, biggest text, and black on white, high contrast, the strongest level of contrast. And then you'll read this. A, because we tend uh, to, in our society to read top to bottom. Um, and B, because it's the second largest text, and C, due to proximity, which is one of the Gestalt principles that we're going to be discussing later on. The graphic is designed as a loop that starts in the middle of the page with the big text, you will read this first, and then reads down and finishes back at the top, pulling you back into the loop. And this makes it more interesting than simply putting the beginning of the message at the very top of the page. There are conventions that you should follow, though. For example, you wouldn't put your lowest scaffolding elements at the top of the page. The top is still prime visual real estate, so you have to be logical with your placements. But this does show the power of text size and contrast to control how your viewer will take in the information. So we're going to start our discussion of design principles with Edward Tufte. Um, Tufte is an American statistician and a sculptor. He wrote and designed four classic books on data visualization, and I have them in my office if anyone would like to check them out. He's been described as the Leonardo da Vinci of data and the Galileo of graphics by somewhat reputable sources. All right, Tufty's four design principles. Number one, maximize data ink ratio. Number two, avoid chart junk. Sometimes it's just one word. Three, Think about providing double functionality. We're going to talk about all these in just a second. And number four, increase data density. So first, let's talk about the data ink ratio. Um, you want to maximize it. 
And here's how that looks for those of you who are mathematically inclined. <laughs> the data ink ratio um, is basically the ink used for the actual data. If you summed the amount of ink used for the actual data in a graphic and then divided it by the total ink used in the whole graphic, that ratio should be a big number. Uh, most of the ink in the graphic should be used to focus our eye on the data and the message. Remember those transparent histograms showing the shift in age of women having their first child? That had very large data ink ratio. It was very focused on just the message at hand. So try and use as little ink as possible to show the data, says Edward Tufte. And I would add, you have to do that within reason. So here's a classic bar chart with X and Y axes, labels, legend, title, horizontal grid lines. You could reduce uh, the, the non-essential ink in this graphic by getting rid of the vertical axis, get rid of um, the Y axis labels and directly label the bars with the values so that you don't even have to try and decode them. Um, we're employing color for an actual reason, not just to make the bars blue, but we're drawing attention to a particular bar, and we got rid of the redundant legend. So again, data ink is the non-erasable core of a graphic. It's the ink that's non-redundant. Here's an example of redundant encoding. Um, here's a bar on a bar chart. And there is a value that this bar represents. It's one of probably many bars on the chart, and they each have their own value. The value comes from the labels on the y-axis or from a direct label, right? The value is also coming, though, from the height of the bar. And our eyes compare this height to the other bars and over to the value on the y-axis. Same with the area. That's also encoding the differences between the bars. Um, so the height and the area are both encoding the value for this bar, but we're also encoding the value by the frame on the left side and the top and the right side. Each one of these is a different set of ink that's giving us a height that we're using to judge. Plus, if we label it, it's got an actual value, plus the level of that value, the height at which it's placed on the page, is another way of letting us compare the different bar heights. This might seem like it's overkill, but I'm trying to get at the point that we have a lot of ways of passing this information on and we can simplify. There's no reason that the bar needs to have um, color. It doesn't need to have a different colored frame around it. Um, we don't need to be um, taking so many steps, basically. Simplify. Here's our classic box and whisker plot. Edward Tufte would argue that the plot on the right conveys the same information with less redundant ink. So here the dot is marking the median and the box is alluded to by the internal white space between the vertical bars. So to me, this is a bit stripped down. It's a little bit too minimalistic. Um, we aren't used to seeing box and whiskers displayed this way and it would definitely have a steep learning curve. But this is the extremes uh, to which Edward Tufte takes things sometimes. And I, I get his point. Okay, with the data ink ratio, you have to strike a balance. And I think that's what it boils down to. So take a look at this statter, a standard scatter plot and visually assess it. I'm not talking about reading it, but just assess it visually. Do the squint test. So the colored observation points are the data. Everything else is non-data ink. There's a lot of non-data ink on this chart. Unnecessary frames around the plot panel and the legend. The coordinate grid is too dominant. The black on white draws attention away from the data points. By removing the frames and minor grid lines, and by drawing the major grid lines in a light gray, you might get something more like this. Here, the subtle background grid is just enough to anchor the points in space and set off the data area from the legend area. Unnecessary frames have been removed, minor grid lines have been removed, and major grid lines have been drawn in light gray just to kind of stand back relative to the data points. This is the, the kind of data ink removal being taken too far. 
The axis ticks and labels and title are so faint that they're really hard to see. You can't really um, grasp what this figure is about just by glancing at it. And look at the legend. There's no clear visual separation between it and the plot area. The legend descriptions are so faint that it almost looks like the points could be mistaken for data points. Okay, so on the left here is a relatively clean and streamlined data presentation. So how could we clean this up? What to you looks like redundant ink? You could consider changing to a custom number format so that the y-axis reads in centimeters. Um, it's, I think, preferable to have the unit right there where the people are reading the numbers so they don't have to go hunting for the units. And that way you'd be getting rid of in centimeters in the title, which is a little clunky. But we definitely want to get rid of the frames. We could also get rid of every other uh, label on the y-axis. There's no reason to have them labeled quite that often. That's much cleaner. Another thing we could do is just label the bars directly and do away with all the um, labels on the y-axis altogether or just get rid of the whole frame. If we're labeling them directly, do we need to have the y-axis separated at all? Um, also, if space is at a premium, you could reduce the white space between the bars. Um, I think there's more white space than, than data right now, and that could maybe be collapsed down a little bit. I think it's better to have um, slightly less space between the bars than they are wide. Okay, principle number two, chart junk. The key here is to avoid it. So what are we talking about with chart junk? They're the unnecessary visual elements in charts that distract the viewer from the information. So this just isn't about um, redundant encoding or non-data ink. These are worse than that. These are distracting elements on the page. <laughs> the addition of a fake perspective to the data structure clutters many graphics. This variety of chart junk, um, which according to uh, Edward Tufte, is in high fashion in the world of boutique data graphics, uh, is very common in corporate reports, um, silly statistical studies in advertisements, mass media. Um, you've seen this a lot. This weird 3D display appeared in a magazine called American Education in the 1970s. Here, they're using five colors, um, are reporting five pieces of data. <laughs> Edward Tufte said, this may well be the worst graphic ever to find its way into print. Now, we're not going to go into reading it. Uh, I spent a few minutes trying to decode it, and I finally just gave up because I'm not even sure what they're talking about here. But the colors truly don't have any um, relevance at all. Um, and I think it was part of a series of graphics that were equally just about kind of graphic look and less about presenting the data. So I think the, the take home here is don't go promoting your own graphic ability at the ex expense of the data display. Good data visualizations are often the case of less is more. Okay, so redundant or non-data ink and chart junk are those elements in a chart that add no further value and are visually distracting from the main message. Um, funny shapes and sizes of things, redundant labels, unnecessary grid lines, over-the-top use of colors, and everything that a creative mind can think of, really. Chart junk is definitely a relative term. An elephant, an elephant, an element that may appear as chart junk in one graph could serve a useful function in another and vice versa. Remember how we talked about 3D plots. 3D is chart junk, for sure. Okay, so what can we do to clean this up here? Does the chart area border help with information gathering from this plot? No, it doesn't. Do we need the grid lines to evaluate the height? No, we don't, they're labeled. Does the background color make the information more readable? I would argue that it doesn't. Um, it does reduce the contrast between the bars and the background, um, and it does draw attention to the graphic area itself, 
doesn't necessarily make the bars more readable. Um, what are the tick marks in between providing? Absolutely nothing. Absolutely no question about it. The legend is completely redundant. Double labels, not necessary. The color is also not necessary. And a drop shadow. Ugh, avoid drop shadows. This is moving into 3D world and we don't need to do that. Definitely chart junk. How about this though? Is this chart junk? Here's the same data in bar chart form. Monstrous costs, campaign expenditures for House and Senate, millions of dollars. I don't think of these cartoons personally as chart junk, but you can decide for yourself. They are an editorial tool. They're cartoons, they're catchy, engaging, memorable. Are they harmful to the comprehension of the data? I think it's probably, I love how the tire tracks go over his tail. I think they're tire tracks. Um, so the bar chart on the right, uh, in addition to being very poorly constructed and totally lacking visual hierarchy, is not compelling at all. But is it maybe going to be taken more seriously? Possibly. So these are the kinds of balances that you need to strike. I don't expect you guys to draw cartoons, but um, as far as you know, being a savvy consumer of data and graphics, something to think about. Okay, double functionality. This is a really lovely, um, I guess I'd call it a poem. Typographical delight of the statistician, W.J. Yowden. It's, it's a little uh, poem about uh, normal distributions and it was written in the shape of a normal distribution. That's lovely. I just show it to you because I think it's kind of fabulous. Okay, so uh, double uses. The same ink should often serve more than one graphical purpose, if possible. A graphical element may carry data information and also perform a, de a design function usually left to non-data ink. And we're gonna look at a couple examples. Um, this is a horrible example. Maybe, to me, one of the worst infographics ever. How much sleep do we need at each age? So for some reason, they had to show a cartoon of a baby growing up to an older man and have the years, and then somehow transpose those to these little bathroom door people, um, which just makes no sense. become a student of the blade, you only need seven to eight hours of sleep. <laughs> Fabulous. Okay. This is a, a really fun example. Um, here's a probability chart on the left. And what we've done on the right to clean it up, and not we, but is instead of having the classic graph setup, we've replaced the Y scale with the exact value at each bin or observation. So we've got um, we basically are creating the graph and just instead of using bars, we're using the actual numbers to encode. Now, I don't know that this is as effective because the area under the bars, the area under the graph should total one. And I think we lose that context here. But um, I do like the idea of replacing the point, like in a scatter plot, with just the number that it's supposed to represent or the bar chart. You know, why couldn't you just have a sliding scale and instead of having any kind of symbol sliding along, um, you know, the scale, just have the actual number sitting there. I think it's kind of a cool idea. Okay, and finally, I want to introduce the idea of data density. It's exactly like it sounds. It's the ratio of area devoted to the content or data relative to the whole area of the figure. Of the figure. So the number of entries in the data matrix is just kind of a fancy way of saying the content. And then it's basically the entire area of the content or the data compared to the whole area of the graphic. This is very low data density this is very high data density. Going back to our probability curve, um, this was calculated to have uh, a quote-unquote unscientific four numbers per square inch or 0.6 numbers per square centimeter, whereas this chart, <laughs> in luscious contrast, uh, has 
300 numbers per square inch or 45 per square centimeter. This is, uh, well, yeah, that's my point about data density. Okay, so there are other dimensions that go into design principles, subjective dimensions that are a little bit harder to quantify. And um, some of these include aesthetics. It's just true that attractive things are perceived as more useful. People use pictures and colors and graphics for a reason. They attract attention. Um, the style, and it can be everything from branding, um, font choices. Um, designers often have their own look to the graphics that they create. Playfulness encourages experimentation, exploration. And vivid, vividness can make a visualization more memorable. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. It's okay to attract attention. And it's okay to use tricks to get people's attention. But be careful about you know, misleading. Be careful about becoming distracting. And be careful um, not to make it more about your graphical prowess or designer prowess and keep it focused on the data. So in summary, Tufty principles, maximize the data ink ratio, keep it heavy on the data, avoid harmful chart junk, don't put stuff in there like 3D just because you can, and uh, focus on heavy data density, not light data density. And I leave you with this gorgeous infographic about Hamilton. It's a word analysis, and it includes word per minute calculations of the four most word dense songs, a list of the most common words and phrases, and all of the words that rhyme with burr, and how often they were used. Genius.